Graham Baum describió e imprimió en Malvinas el primer número del Penguin News el 3 de octubre de 1979. Acababa de cumplir 22 años. Hasta mediados de los 90 fue editor de aquel periódico, el único que se publicaba en las islas. Hoy vive en Inglaterra desde mediados de los 90. Conserva una mirada crítica sobre la guerra del 82 y sobre los temas del presente. Graham, let me take you first before we go to 82. Let me take you first to 81 because something I I I think I've learned is that uh, back in the island before the war you were facing your own issues and uh, and and I would like to know what was uh, I I would like you to share uh, what was the life back there in that time before 1982 um Well, I was, I'd started a little newspaper and I worked for my family business and um, we were living there um, quite happily. We had pretty good relations with Argentina and uh, the, the political situation was difficult, but we had broadly good relations with Argentina and um, I think generally speaking, we were reasonably happy economically. Uh, things were still not going well. The population was declining, but I was very young. Um, I'd come back after living a little while in the UK, and I was reasonably happy doing what I was doing. Um, and um, we had problems with the British government. We had problems with the Argentine government. Um, so we felt that uh, we didn't have too many friends in the world, but we were getting by. Um, the the problems I I understand that had to do with the, the negotiations between Argentina and UK about the sovereignty. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, and, you know, we felt that the British government was pushing us into the arms, the open arms of Buenos Aires, uh, and uh, there wasn't didn't appear to be very much we could do about it because uh, we were not um, our wishes, certainly our wishes were not um, being respected very much um, and uh, so we were not happy about that um, and at the same time we were very suspicious of Argentine intentions obviously with some reason. En 1982, antes de la guerra, los gobiernos argentino y británico negociaban un acuerdo para la soberanía compartida de las islas. Había en Malvinas maestras argentinas que enseñaban español empresas de servicios y se vendían revistas, frutas y mercadería enviadas desde el continente. Yeah. Uh, before we we talk about the the war, uh, tell us a little bit about Penguin News. Um, well, that was not a sophisticated paper. I mean, it still goes today, 40 years on. No more than that. Um, we started it in 79, so it's 43 or whatever. Um, so it still continues and I still write for it. Uh, I just sent them a story today, and which is very nice. It's my baby. But it was very unsophisticated and, you know, it was what I think you might call today uh, guerrilla journalism, you know. Um, and it owed a lot, looking back on it, I think, to the influence of being in the UK in the 70s when anybody thought that they could run a magazine or a newspaper. And the Penguin News looked like it and read like it. And looking back on it, I'm kind of equal quantities proud of it and slightly embarrassed. Yeah. But, but it, it grew a lot and it's a, it's a beautiful archive of, of the local history in, in the island. Very important, not just because it is independent and it gives people a chance to say what they want. Um, Uh, it, but it is also the first draft of history, you know, um, and, and was then as well. So that uh, whatever has been written in Penguin News is a contemporaneous account. And it's very important for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Graham, where were you uh, when, the, when the troops came in April, in 82? I was in Stanley and uh, I, uh, I wasn't... Uh, Uh, a soldier. I wasn't. I was just trying to run Penguin News and uh, make a living like that. So I was in Stanley, and uh, when the battle began, I was at the Upland Goose Hotel, 
which is uh, which was in those days owned by my godmother and uh, my uncle, and um, so we, it was natural. And the, their children were my very close friends, so it was natural that I went and spent the time with them because my parents were not in the islands at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't see it coming. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the issues, uh, the, the weeks before, there's no mention. No. No, there wasn't any mention. Although we, I could see something was coming. I didn't know what it was, but I thought that if, if it reached a denouement, it was going to be in South Georgia. It wasn't going to be in uh, the Falklands. Mm -hmm. That was my belief. I didn't, uh, I, we could see something was going to reach a climax, uh, but we didn't believe it was going to be in the islands. Uh, so that came as a great shock. Um, but I did, as I took my parents to the airport only about uh, one week before. I, I remember saying to my father, if anything happens while you're away, you need to carry on to, uh, they were going to Montevideo via Buenos Aires. And I said to them, you need to make sure you stay in Montevideo or you go on to, to, to London. Um, and so we had this conversation because we could see that things were getting very, quite dangerous. En el número del 23 de marzo de 1982 aparecieron las primeras noticias sobre la crisis de las Georgias del Sur. El 16 de marzo de ese año, un grupo de chatarreros argentinos empleados por el empresario Constantino Davidov había desembarcado en el puerto de las islas para desmontar los restos de algunas instalaciones balleneras. En medio del trabajo, izaron la bandera celeste y blanca. Científicos del British Antarctic Survey que estaban en el lugar informaron a Inglaterra y rápidamente comenzó a escalar la tensión. Um, when, what, what happened with, with the newspaper and with your family and with you when things started to get more complicated back there in the island? Um, at first, for the first few days, the Argentines were so euphoric um, that they, there was no control, there was no limitation to the number of photographs I took. I could talk to people, I could do more or less what I wanted. Um, with Penguin News, but it quickly became clear when I started speaking to um, the high command uh, who had moved in to run the local government that I would only be allowed to publish Penguin News if I did it under their control. And I didn't want to do that. I'd much rather not publish anything than publish it, um, you know, in a, in a censored form. Uh, they made it clear that Uh, that that would have to be that way. Um, they said they would set up interviews with um, Menendez, for example, and others, um, but they wanted to see what I was writing and blah, 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 the usual thing that you expect, that kind of dictatorship. So um, I said, I just said to myself, no, we'll leave it and we'll resume publication when normality returns, if it ever does. Um, well, that, that, thing, that kind of control was the same, more or less, than the one we have back in Buenos Aires and, uh, and the promises with the dictatorship. Yeah, yeah. And there were very few brave... I know the Buenos Aires Herald, for example, and maybe some Spanish-speaking papers were very brave, but, you know, there was no way that I could produce anything um, covertly or underground. We were a village of hardly anybody. And uh, in any case, I mean, the truth of it was, it took me weeks to get an issue out because it was winding a machine like by hand. <laughs> so, you know, the practicalities of it, it, you know, it just didn't make any sense at all. It was better not to do it. And I accepted that. So in instead, I decided that I was going to um, make as many records as I possibly could. So I took a lot of photographs, um, which... Uh, just now, uh, in fact, next week opening is an exhibition in London, and um, I made a lot of notes, uh, which diaries and journals, which I never really uh, looked at very much until about two years ago when I decided to edit them, and I have them coming out as a book as well. And um, and so yeah, I just decided that I was going to record what I saw. That would be what I did. Have you been back to the island recently? Yeah, I was there um, a month ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and how are are they living there these these special days and preparing for the uh, remembrance of eighty two? 
Well, um, I think quite sensibly they're looking ahead as much as they are looking forward. Um, because after 40 years, um, one has to accept that it, it is history now. Uh, clearly, it's a very raw kind of history. But um, they are very sensibly looking ahead uh, as much as they're looking back. And um, I did some filming there with a, a colleague. And um, we, that was the message that was coming out. Um, memories are still strong amongst those people who were there. But after 40 years, not that many people. Uh, there are far more people who've arrived, either being born or come into the islands uh, than since 82, than there were islanders who were there in 82. The number of people who experienced it is actually not that high anymore. I mm -hmm. don't have a number, but so, but it is ingrained in the national psyche. En las islas, en lugar de conmemorar el 2 de abril, se recuerda con más fuerza el 14 de junio como el día de la liberación. Otras fechas que se conmemoran son el 3 de enero de 1833, fecha de la ocupación británica, y el 21 de abril, el cumpleaños de la reina. Cuando uh, estaba en London hace uh, unos años, uh, tuve la feeling de que uh, Falklands no era un problema ahí. No es un subjeto de mucha importancia. Dice que vas a mostrar algunas fotos ahí y algunas cosas. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a living issue anymore, but it is a milestone in history. And because we have um, gone through a very strange process in the in Britain over the last uh, six or seven years, which is going, society and politics have gone a long way to the right. And in going to the right, they've also embraced um, with fondness their the country's uh, history of empire and there is a feeling that um, you know we the country has lost that greatness and that we should try and regain it and that we're much better somehow uh, than than our neighbors now this is all rubbish complete rubbish but there is a growing belief uh, has been that's been the predominant that's been the most powerful force in politics in this country for the last six or seven years, which resulted in Brexit, uh, yeah. the disaster of Brexit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in fact, quite far from making us any stronger, it's made us weaker, but people will still not accept that. And they look back um, to chapters in British history. Um, they ignore the inconvenient truths, of course, but they look back on chapters in uh, British history, which they can uh, polish up a little bit and show, you know, which somehow supports their belief that Britain, as we say here, uh, punches above its weight, that it's a, it's a better country. What all this boils down to is nationalism. And, you know, there is a, there is a force of nationalism now. Um, Graham, uh, what do you think uh, you have learned after these 40 years of, of, about Falkland specifically? Uh, that oh, we never learn, you know. I have nothing but disdain, complete and utter disdain, uh, for for people who create these narratives, um, use false narratives to build up uh, a sense of nationalism, a sense of victimization, and they then decide that they're going to march off to war and sacrifice. Uh, a lot of people, uh, young people, who, who have no choice in the matter. And um, we're seeing it, we saw it in 82. Uh, I've come to realize that it's a much more powerful and common thing than I ever believed it was. And we're seeing it again, in many ways, so, so similar in Ukraine at the moment. The parallels are quite remarkable. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, personally have come to, to, to despair, really, of, um, of mankind, because we seem to be unable to get away from this tribalism, and I can't even begin to tell you how much I hate it, and I hate even more the people who exploit it, who create these false narratives, 
and um, then uh, find useful idiots to believe it. Um, so, you know, I, I personally, I, I hate nationalism, can't stand it. Never did really, but now I think it's just the worst uh, force in the world. And, um, you know, we saw it at its worst in the Falklands. We see it again today. We see it in Britain with Brexit. We see it in Russia. Um, and I don't know whether it's dead in Argentina, but it needs to be. Mm. Um, do you think uh, uh, one of the things I discovered going to Falkland in 2018 and 2019 is that there is some kind of, of new generation of people, of, of young leaders that have born after the war, that have uh, traveled around the war. Do you have some kind of hope of some other kind of leadership uh, or some uh, different direction in, in what's coming? In the islands? Well, they're doing what, what is natural for them. They, they want to make the islands uh, prosperous, they want to make them secure, they want to get on with their lives uh, <clears throat> in the way that they want to follow their lives, and um, they're able to do that. So they can do it with or without good relations with Argentina, preferably with good relations with Argentina, because it just makes life so much more easily easy. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why uh, they shouldn't continue to follow their dreams in the islands. Um, you know, uh, I personally see the problem not there, but the problem is um, a lack of maturity in Argentina. If you can get over that, then we could all live as happy families. Thank you very much for your time. Just let me tell you something that I uh, uh, try to tell to every journalist and researcher here. Uh, that is an invitation to read Penguin News. Although you say it's a very crafted paper, but it's a, a beautiful uh, file about the local history in Falklands and it's very important to read it and, and know it in UK, in Falklands and here in, in Argentina. Yeah, it's a great record, it really is. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Graham. My pleasure.